go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. Happy Easter to you from all of us here at the Station of the Cross. Hey, good news. Praise be to God. Catholic Joe Biden has publicly repented of his support for immoral behavior, activities, public, private, or otherwise. Okay, April Fool's, it's not true. Actually, he went kind of the other way. Sorry. I, could, I couldn't. It's April 1st. I couldn't help it. In fact, he went the other way. On Easter Sunday, he proclaimed the National Day of Visibility for Trans. Turns out there's more than 50 LGBTQ+. Plus Official holidays on the calendar. Did you know there was more than 50? We're going to be talking about that and contrasting that with somebody who might might have something greater to say about Easter on Easter Sunday, other than Trans Day of Visibilities. That is St. Augustine. I'm going to share with you a very short and sweet and to the point and a powerful speech, a homily given on Easter 1,600 years ago by St. Augustine, courtesy of of our good friend Joshua Charles. That's coming up today at 14 past the hour. And then we're going to have a conversation with Michael Veerlander. He is back from FatimaFarm.com. FatimaFarm.com is back on. Let's talk about Easter traditions. What traditions have you upheld this Easter and what, which ones are still to come? All of that and more coming up this hour. And you can find everything linked up in the show notes over at the thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. So much to get into. Do share us with a friend but let's start in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful, O Mother of the Word incarnate. Despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your Saint of the Day. Saint Hugh of Grenoble, pray for us. Hugh was born to devout parents in southeastern France in the year of our Lord 1053. A devout child himself, Hugh took a position at the cathedral in, Ve- uh, in Valence whilst yet a layman. His wisdom and piety were such that before he'd taken holy orders, and while still under the age of 30, Hugh was chosen to become the new bishop of Grenoble, a diocese in desperate need of reform. He traveled to Rome to be consecrated by Pope St. Gregory VII himself, then proceeded to his new diocese. Grenoble was in such a poor state that after two years, Hugh had made almost no progress in reforming it, and he resigned to seek solace in a Benedictine monastery until Pope Gregory ordered him to return. Hugh resumed his efforts with far more success and led his flock for the next several decades. In 1084, Hugh granted a tract of wilderness in the Chartreuse Mountains to St. Bruno of Cologne and his companions, where they founded the Order of Carthusians. Hugh loved the Carthusian way of life so much that St. Bruno often had to order the bishop to return to his diocese when he spent too long visiting the monastery. Hugh died in the year of our Lord 1132 and was canonized just two years later. He is a patron against headaches, from which he patiently suffered almost continuously for decades. The Carthusians celebrate his feast on April 22nd. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. St. Hugh of Grenoble, pray for us. And now your headline news. CNN reports bus carrying Easter worshippers plunges off bridge, killing 45 people in South Africa. The crash claimed the lives of 45 people. And the sole survivor, an eight-year-old girl, was airlifted to hospital with serious injuries. According to the South African Broadcasting Corporation, 
The passengers were pilgrims, Christian pilgrims, traveling from Garbone to the capital uh, the capital city of the neighboring country of Botswana to the Zion Christian Church in the town of Moriah for an Easter conference. I'm not sure why they still struggle to call them Christians. Anyway, the New York Post is reporting arson attack destroys 117-year-old Christian church in the latest symbol of Portland mayhem. Cameron David Storr, a trans, was arrested following an investigation by the Portland Fire and Rescue Fire Investigations Unit. The 27-year-old is charged with two counts of first-degree arson, one count of second-degree arson, and two counts of second-degree burglary, all felonies. Storr stated that they heard voices in their head saying they would mutilate Storr if they did not burn the church down and that they had planned it up to one day in advance. Storr allegedly told investigators he was taking oxycodone and had a history of mental illness. And apparently shares a lot in common with Smeagol from Lord of the Rings. Anyway, Daily Mail reports fury as FDNY firefighters are forced to remove stars and stripes honoring 9-11 heroes after Democrat lawmaker branded it as a fascist symbol. Authorities at the New York City Fire Department commanded a ladder company in the East Village to remove a flag honoring six of the company's men who perished on 9-11 after a resident complained it was a fascist symbol. The order arrived on March the 22nd after a man who said he was with the Manhattan Councilwoman Carlina Rivera confronted firefighters at Ladder Company 11. Ladder Company 11 displays the flag beside a memorial sign on the back of its truck commemorating the lives of Lieutenant Michael Quilty and firefighters Michael Camarada, Edward Day, John Heffernan, Richard Kelly Jr., and Matthew Rogan all of whom were killed while responding to the 9-11 terror attacks. God rest their souls. Those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Matthew chapter 28, verses 8 through 15. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went away quickly from the tomb, fearful yet overjoyed, and ran to announce the news to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them on their way and greeted them. They approached, embraced his feet, and did him homage. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had happened. The chief priests assembled with the elders and took counsel. Then they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, You are to say his disciples came by night and stole him while we were asleep. And if this gets to the ears of the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. The soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has circulated among the Jews to the present day. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. The great commentary of Cornelius Alapide says, Because they had seen the angels and had received from them the joyful news of his resurrection, their minds, therefore, were alternating between joy and fear. So St. Jerome says, A twofold feeling possessed the minds of the women Fear and joy, fear at the greatness of the miracle, joy in their desire for him that was risen. It is an interesting contrast, is it not? This uh, fear and joy and something we've talked about uh, from a thematic point of view. If you go back to Mount Sinai, the people were in fear of the Lord. Well, fire descending from heaven, burning the top of the mountain might, might give them some cause for fear for sure. But why do we live in fear versus awe of the Lord? Well, if we are in a state of grace, we are in awe of the Lord, a joyful awe, a fear of the Lord, to be sure, but an awe of the Lord. If we are afraid of the Lord, like, say, Adam in the uh, hiding in the bush in Genesis chapter 3, when the Lord comes walking in the cool of the day, the Hebrew word being ko, to bring the 
awe of the Lord. It's kind of like uh, seeing Darth Vader walk from the midst of the smoke on that ship in A New Hope, right? Dum, dum, da dum. You just, your heart is beating. Your hands are sweaty and you are in fear of the Lord because you are in sin and you fear his judgment. So live in a state of grace and have a healthy fear of the Lord versus an unhealthy one because you fear the fires of hell. Tropologically, says uh, uh, Cornelius Lapide, Rabunus says, Jesus sometimes meets those who are entering on the path of virtue by helping them. Moreover, Eve is to us the mother of perdition and of sorrow. But these women, instead of the word Eva, bear the word Ave, because they are the messengers of resurrection, salvation, and joy. Hence, we sing to the Blessed Virgin, the Mother of Christ, the Queen of these women, the hymn Ave Maristella. See here the perversity of the priests and elders who, not content with having put Christ to death, persecute him after his death and try to do away with his resurrection so as to cover their crime and lest anyone should rise against them as the slayers of Christ and avenge his death. This was the design of the devil who was attempting to destroy the church and all Christians in Christ. The priests corrupt the soldiers with money, who were witnesses of the truth, that they might become witnesses of a lie. St. Jerome says that they took this money from the treasury of the temple and therefore were guilty of sacrilege. Guilty of sacrilege. Yikes. Talking about yikes, let's talk about this after the break. On the day of the resurrection of the one Savior, the one mediator between God and man, the only way by which one can obtain eternal salvation to see the Father for all eternity. Instead, we're celebrating Trans Day of Visibility, and this is proclaimed by a Catholic? That's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It is so good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, coming up at 30 past the hour, Michael Verlander is back from FatimaFarm.com. Let's talk about Easter traditions. You know, one of the cool Easter traditions that my family just got to enjoy was the blessing of Easter baskets to include all of that yummy, awesome Easter food that you've been you know, sacrificing over the course of Lent. And now you get to enjoy. Well, our priest had us all come out with our baskets and bless them. It was an amazing experience. But what are some of these Easter traditions that we hold to? And we're going to get Michael Verlander to weigh in on that at 30 past there. And I'd love to hear what yours are. You can leave those in the com box of the live video feed for one way to get a hold of us. And you can do that right now at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. If you go down to the live video player just underneath, you'll find the links to the other live feeds. Don't forget, you can also hang out with us right on our station uh, app, which is iCatholic Radio. You can search for it in your iOS or Android app store. Just look for iCatholic Radio. Make sure to leave a review so other people can find it too. And hang out with us every day. Be on the team. We'd love to have you. Lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. And you know, it's April 1st. You almost couldn't write a better headline. Catholic Joe Biden, Transgender Day of Visibility, is just one of 50 LGBTQ plus celebrations coming out of the White House on the official public calendar. So instead of, uh, you know, really focusing on salvation upon uh, the the God man, upon, you know, the one and only way towards salvation, the one and only way towards heaven itself— the resurrection, because death couldn't even hold him back. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, instead of really focusing on that, we get Easter bunnies on the White House lawn and we get trans day of visibility. This is absolutely mind blowing. But Biden's proclamation issued on Good Friday of all days, the day our Lord is suffering on the cross because of our sins, another sacred day for Christians, announced that transgender Americans are part of the fabric of our nation and called for the passage of the Equality Act. That law would codify Democrats' embrace of gender identity, 
that made up con the made up concept that one can identify as a sex other than what they were born as a, as and become that sex. Democrats have tried to pass the bill for years, but have yet to get it across the president's desk. This from Catholic Joe Biden. And this is a uh, it's a White House proclamation. I'll link to the actual proclamation itself from WhiteHouse.gov. A proclamation on Transgender Day of Visibility, which was to take place on all days, March the 31st, which is Easter Sunday. Hmm. You think that might be intentional? Do you think it might at all be intentional that on the day that Christians, or as CNN calls us, Easter worshipers, that we are faced with a public proclamation of the Transgender Day visibility? Well, I tell you what. I would like to compare and contrast this to WWSAD. What would St. Augustine do? What would St. Augustine do? Uh, I saw a post from our friend Joshua Charles. You might remember Joshua Charles. He's a he's a scholar, really, a biblical scholar. And we interviewed him in our documentary film on the end times, The Secret of the Saints in the End Times. And I would encourage you to check that film out. If you've not watched it already, you can actually do so right now on our ICR Plus, our premium content on the mobile app. If you download the iCatholic Radio mobile app, just check out the ICR Plus tab in the bottom right. It's there. Just hit play. All you got to do is hit play. It's it's uh, it's a great film. We've gotten a lot of wonderful feedback. And Joshua Charles was the main thread through the entire film, taking us on a journey of what the church believes and doesn't believe about the end times. What can we expect and when can we expect it? I think his findings are interesting and startling to some. So check that out. Uh, Joshua Charles here giving us a short homily from St. Augustine given 1,600 years ago. And I want to read it to you. It's short and sweet, but it's powerful stuff. He says, St. Augustine's Easter Sunday exhortation delivered on this day, which was yesterday, approximately 1,600 years ago, rings as true and relevant as ever. On this day, Easter, I address those who have been baptized, reborn in Christ Jesus, and you, my brethren, in them and they in you. Behold, you have become members of Christ. If you consider what you have become, all your bones will cry out. Lord, who is like thee? Psalm 34, 10. For what condescension of God, namely that grace has come gratuitously to you without any antecedent merits on your part, cannot be adequately pondered. All human utterance and feelings fail us. Because it is given gratis or free. For that very reason, it is called grace. What grace? That you should be members of Christ, sons of God, that you should be brothers of the only begotten. If he is only begotten, how are you his brothers unless, while he is only begotten by nature, you have become his brothers by grace? Therefore, because you have become members of Christ, I warn you, I fear for you, not so much from the pagans, nor so much for the, from the Jews, nor so much from the heretics, as from bad Catholics. Choose for yourselves those whom you may imitate among the people of God, for if you wish to imitate the crowd— you will not tread the narrow path in the company of the few. I think that's worthy of repeating, I would argue. He wants us, St. Augustine said 1,600 years ago, he wants you, he wants me to stay clear of bad Catholics. They seem to be a virus that can spread, a pandemic of sorts that could cause great suffering. Some might say eternal suffering. St. Augustine says, choose for yourselves those whom you may imitate among the people of God. For if you wish to imitate the crowd, you will not tread the narrow path in the company of the few. Kind of makes you think of good old Catholic Joe Biden. The fact that he has not been excommunicated yet boggles the mind given his 
doubling, tripling, quadrupling down every time he's challenged by it. His support for abortion, and now even up to birth, it seems. His support for in vitro fertilization, let alone his total destruction of marriage, the sacramental marriage between a man and a woman. The foundation, the very fabric of society based on natural law that even the pagans accept. Rome, Rome had all kinds of manners of perversities, homosexual and otherwise, but they didn't mess, they didn't mess all that much with marriage, which is interesting, isn't it? Because it becomes the very fabric of society. When you destroy marriage, when the, when the assault upon marriage is front and center, you know, bad things are about to go down. I mean, it doesn't take an eclipse across the United States. Yes, of course, the eclipse will enter the United States on a city called Job and then cross over seven different cities called Nineveh before it crosses over into Canada and then also cross a city called Nineveh there. I mean, pure coincidence, I'm sure, that a total eclipse, a eclipse you know, n- might be sending us a message, might not be. Either way, you don't have to be a scholar or even St. Augustine to come to certain conclusions that bad company can have bad consequences. Your peer group matters. And if you are a Catholic, especially a public one, and you embrace these evils, these errors, only bad can come from that. Be careful who your friends are. St. Augustine goes on. Abstain from fornication, robbery, fraud, perjury, from illicit conduct, and from quarrels. Keep drunkenness at a distance from you. Fear adultery as you fear death. Not the death which releases the soul from the body, but that in which the soul will burn forever. Hmm. Maybe I should should repeat that for you. Fear adultery as you fear death. Not that death which releases the soul from the body, but that in which the soul will burn forever. Which reminds me, one of my traditions on Holy Saturday, I read the letter to the Hebrews from St. Paul. Yes, St. Paul wrote that. Yes, St. Paul is the author of the letter to the Hebrews. I do not care what your biblical scholar says. He simply dictated it to St. Luke, and there you go. Anyway, St. Paul says in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage honorable in all and the bed undefiled for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Hebrews 13, 4. St. Augustine goes on, I beg you by the name which has been invoked upon you, by the altar to which you have been, which you have approached, by the sacraments which you have received, by the future judgment of the living and the dead, I beg you. I put you under obligation in the name of Christ not to imitate those persons whom you have known and are such described. I beg you, don't be like them. On the contrary, St. Augustine says, may the sacrament baptism of him who did not wish to come down from the cross, but who did wish to rise from the tomb endure. He didn't want to come down from that cross and therein lies the temptation of Christ, the last temptation of Christ. Come down, come down. It was the devil who didn't want Jesus to die on that cross, to suffer for you, for me, and for Joe Biden. May the Catholic bishops excommunicate him out of charity alone, that it might awaken within his soul and the last opportunities that they have to do so towards a healthy repentance. Because time is running out for Joe Biden and for all of us who willfully refuse to repent. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 30 says, For if we sin willfully, after having the knowledge of the truth, there is now left no sacrifice for sins. If we sin willfully, after having the knowledge of the truth, there is now left no sacrifice for sins. 
but a certain dreadful expectation of judgment and the rage of a fire which shall consume the adversaries. A man making void the law of Moses, Moses dieth without any mercy under two or three witnesses. How much more do you think he deserveth worse punishment who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath esteemed the blood of the testament unclean by which he was sanctified and hath offered an affront to the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth to me, and I will repay. And again the Lord shall judge his people. Close quote St. Paul in his letter to the Hebrews. Chapter 10, verses 26 through 30. If you knew the truth and you rejected it, God help you. The hell of fire is waiting for you. Repent. While you have time, and dear bishops, please, by the grace of God, excommunicate Joe Biden that he might also repent. Time is running out. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. More is coming up next. The Station of the Cross is brought to you in part by My Catholic Will. This Lent, consider making an act of charity by including the Station of the Cross in your will. We've partnered with My Catholic Will to make it easy and convenient to create your will, and it's free. Just use referral code 14 stations when you visit mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross. Again, that's mycatholicwill.com forward slash the station of the cross. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. In Touch Weekly reports, King Charles' funeral plans unveiled after monarch is given two years to live with pancreatic cancer. King Charles III has only been Britain's reigning monarch for 18 months Yet his funeral plans are already set amid his battle with pancreatic cancer. Named Operation Mene Bridge, the monarch's funeral procession will look similar to Queen Elizabeth II's ceremonies, dubbed Operation London Bridge. As his cancer progresses, royal insiders tell In Touch that Charles's funeral resting plans, or final resting plans, are of timely prioritization. When the monarch dies, Charles' body will be moved from the throne room at Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. He will lie in state, and his official funeral will take place nine days later. He will likely be buried in the royal vault at Windsor Castle. The Pillar reports Belgian church with lay-led liturgies loses parish status. In a March the 20th statement, Church authorities said the Don Bosco Church in Busingen, about 10 miles southwest of the capital of Brussels, would no longer continue to exist as a parish, though it will have some continuing connection to the Catholic Church. The Vicariate of Flemish, Brabant, and Melikin said that it took a step after a year and a half of talks, which established the major differences remain mainly in the vision of celebrating and presiding over the sacraments. The official website for the Catholic Church in Flanders noted that the Don Bosco Parish was, quote, known for far-reaching innovations in the field of liturgy and sacraments. For example, the Eucharist is led by a lay woman, among others. The Archdiocese said, though it did not specify how a woman or any other lay person could lead the Eucharist, which can only be celebrated by an ordained priest. And Catholic Vote reports, climate change activists invade Easter Mass. Leftist protesters with the radical climate change group Extinction Rebellion disrupted the Easter Vigil Mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City on Saturday evening. The protesters approached the sanctuary, held up a banner, and shouted during the culmination of the highest point in the Catholic liturgical year. Police escorted the protesters out of the Mass. And those, those are your headline news. Praise be to God. Uh, Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. Joining us now, uh, once again, is Michael Verlander from FatimaFarm.com. Michael, happy Easter to you. Praise be to God. Good to have you back on the team. Good to be back, Joe. Happy let's talk Easter. about Yeah, let's talk about traditions, Easter traditions. 
Um, one of the fun things about growing in uh, traditional Catholicism, Latin, right, traditional Catholicism, is you learn to discover things that I didn't, like I didn't know existed before. Uh, we went to Easter Vigil for the first time in years. I can't remember the last time I've been to Easter Vigil Mass. Um, having a bunch of kids up the late that night can be challenging for parents. So we've, we've, we've become an Easter morning mass going family, but we decided we're going to do it this year. And we went to Easter vigil. And one of the things that we discovered that we didn't know about was the dipping of the Paschal candle into the waters of baptism as they were preparing to bring these catechumens into the church. You never get this in the Novus Ordo uh, Mass, unfortunately. We saw this for the first time, and it blew our minds. So I thought, what a fun conversation to talk about Easter traditions. Michael, can you share some of the Easter traditions that you have as a family grown to love? Well, over the last few years, as we have learned more about tradition, and we've tried to bring more of those traditions into our family, we get we get deeper and deeper each year. Uh, but I so I think a, a, a good traditional Easter begins with a good traditional Lent. Uh, mm. So it is it is a time to sacrifice. It is a time for for rejoicing and a time for joy. Uh, but you you understand and you can appreciate true rejoicing only once you have uh, first uh, experienced and sacrificed uh, the the sacrifices that come with Lent. And I and I think that Paschal candle that you mentioned. You know the the dipping down into the water that's that's symbolic of 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 dying and then rising to new life, um, as as every catechumen does uh, when when he or she is is baptized. So there there is a, a death and then a new life. So our experience of, of of first Easter, that Easter morning when we're enjoying, uh, for us it it could be a, a cup of coffee with real milk. It can be you know, the bacon and the bacon on the breakfast table. You know what what comes to my mind is Deo gratias, thanks Amen be to that. God, Alleluia. Yeah, yeah, praise be to God. One of the other fun traditions to sort of make your point is uh, the blessing of the Easter baskets. Also, something I'm, I'm sure lots of parishes have done this, uh, TLM or Novus Order. Otherwise, I'm sure it gets done quite a bit. But we had never experienced it before, so we thought this is a a fun uh, tradition, and that is bringing Easter baskets filled with the kinds of foods that you have abstained from over the course of a good Lent, like you just said, like a a good Lent. So the Easter eggs and, uh, and, and bacon and bread and other cheese and other items, and it was a lot of fun to, uh, to be there and to have all of these items out. My wife, I uh, made, uh, you know, uh, lambs. She has a mold for butter. So we uh, we made butter in the, sh- in the form of a lamb. So we had these lambs with these little victory uh, resurrection flags staked out on them. And so that was a lot of fun. But it was even better when Father had to pull out his book of blessings. And he's like going for like, okay, now this one's for salt. Now this one's for bread. Now this one's for cheese. Now this one's for eggs. I mean, going down the grocery list. And, you know, and you just, you realize it goes back to, uh, you know, the Von Trapp book, you know, it goes back to just what is tradition? Tradition is the lived, breathed um, faith. It's it's the liturgy, but it's plus plus. And I think this is a demonstration of that. And you wonder why in the world do we squander all these traditions? What, what, I mean, like there's such a treasure. Why do we why do we not embrace them more? Why do you think that might be, Michael? Uh, that's a good question, Joe. Uh, and I, I, I wish I, I had the right answer. Um, I mean, I think there's a, a lot of enemies at work. I mean, I think overall there is the, 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 the prince of the world, the Satan, who's the strategist. Uh, I think not just is he working on our individual souls, but I, I think Satan and his, and his uh, minions are working across the globe to, to implement a global strategy to bring down the faithful and to bring down the faith. And, and so I think they have their influence as well. Uh, I think there are, there are those who think that um, modern man, that is us living today, we can't em- embrace uh, the, the traditions of old, that we have moved past them and we need something new. I think the problem with that, uh, there are numerous problems, but one of them is that we'll all be, we'll, we will always be chasing down what that new is and what is, uh, what's right for modern man. If we just hand on what's been handed to us, 
then we know exactly what we're supposed to do and our mission is clear. But mm. you're right. It, it's more than, as we talked about before, it's more than just smells and bells because it is a, it, it's an external expression of our faith. And so the, the, the many blessings that the priest has for the various items that we eat, we are not just souls, but we are body and soul. And so our, our worship to God is, is one that's bodily and spiritual as well. So it's, it's very appropriate for our, our, our faith to engage our body uh, as much as our soul. Did, or did your family go to Easter Vigil or, or Sunday morning? We did, we did not do the Easter Vigil. Uh, we went on Friday, and uh, we did the, the, the Good Friday uh, veneration of the cross. Uh, and we also went on Easter morning. Um, so sim- <clears throat> similar to, to, uh, to your family, I think, in years past, but you did it all this year. Well done. Yeah, well, it was, it's challenging to say the least, but it's also incredibly enriching, um, especially for my children, you know, to help my children have a better, a, a greater sense of um, of appreciation to the Lord and what his sacrifice really truly means, let alone his resurrection. Let me ask you about Sunday morning then. So Sunday morning, you go to mass with your with your wife and your children. Well, what's the rest of the day look like at the Fatima farm? Well, let me let me start even before we go to mass. So, in the Verlander home, for many many years, uh, I have started the day at as the sun rises. Dad blasts through the whole home, handles uh, Alleluia choir, uh, um, Alleluia <laughs> chorus from from um, the Messiah. Um, so, so dad shakes the house with that. So the, the kids come awesome. out of their home, their, their, their rooms, all sleepy eyed. <laughs> um, Alleluia is blasting through the home and, and they find their, their baskets filled with Easter goodies. Um, wow. so that's how Easter begins for us. Uh, and, <laughs> and then, yes, we go, we go to mass and, uh, following that, uh, we, we hang out at the parish for, for, uh, quite a while. Uh, and, um, celebrating with friends, and and then we visited my mom, uh, and brought her Easter tidings. We we learned about family members who came into the church. Uh, hallelujah for that over the over the Easter break, uh, and then uh, and now it's it's Easter Monday, which is traditionally a, a time of, of visiting visiting. Um, I think von Tra- uh, Maria von Trapp speaks of this um, mm-hmm. visiting Monday, where you visit the uh, the elderly, uh, those who are sick. Uh, that must be us today because we have friends visiting us at Fatima Farm today. Um, so we are we're, we're we're playing host to visitors today. Oh, wonderful! Um, one of the traditions that we had yesterday was a couple of years ago we obtained, and I'm not allowed to tell you how we obtained it, but we obtained an older Paschal candle that was destined for the fire um because they they keep they keep some of these and then they they burn them in in pits right so that's how you deal with sacramentals um but we asked if we could obtain we obtained one i can't tell you who or where or why i'm not allowed um but i we obtained one so we have a paschal candle at our home oratory in our home chapel so we lit our paschal candle yesterday and then as a dad i like your idea better though so you running around the house like reveille you know is singing the Alleluia. Boy, that would be that would be so much fun to do. I should try that next year. But uh, so this year, so we lit our Paschal candle, and then my wife a couple of years ago when we were building out our home chapel, got me uh, a thurible. So I lit. We had our we've had our incense blessed by our our pastor, and so we light the thurible up. We take the holy water, and Dad goes on a journey through the house, blessing the entire house. Sprinkling holy water, asking God's protection over my home for my wife, for my children, and our property. That's, I think that you illustrate something very clearly about how dads can lead in these traditions. Although I have to be honest, it's my wife who does most of that heavy lifting. How about you? Uh, well, around here, I, I consider myself kind of the the general who is who is uh, leading the the primary strategy. Uh, within the home, within the Catholic home. And then, yes, my, my wife is implementing on a daily basis. She's the one who is uh, we've, who's going through the catechism questions. I've got four who are being confirmed next week. Uh, wow. So they're rigorously preparing. 
Uh, I've got a son who's preparing for First Communion, he, and so he's got some catechism uh, as well to memorize. Uh, but Joe, and I, I think the best way to do it, as you've as you're doing, is that you let the liturgy flow out into your home. Um, and those are the best traditions I think that we can do in our home is, is the ones that are inspired by the liturgy, um, like the Paschal Candle. Um, so we, we've transitioned at the end of the day. We're now singing the, the Regina Chaley um, during, mm -hmm. during the Easter season. Um, so, so inspired by the Divine Office, which ends with Compline, which ends with uh, a hymn to Our Lady. So we, we say goodnight to Our Lady as a family with the appropriate Marian hymn or Marian antiphon. And for the Easter season, that's the Regina Chaley. So we've started doing that and uh, we'll enjoy that until the end of Easter and we take up the Salve Regina again. Amen. Wow. Hold that thought. Michael Verlander from FatimaFarm.com as our guest. Talking about Easter traditions. If you want to be in on the conversation, I would encourage you to do so. Go to the thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. You can uh, not only join our insider email list, get the show notes and more, but you can also see the live video player. And underneath it, YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, Twitter, it's all right there. And you can leave comments and be a part of our conversation. Do you have Easter traditions that you hold? We would love to hear about them. You can join us right now. Go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. But coming up after the break, how do we keep, how do we keep traditional the next 50 days? More of that is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. Happy Easter to you. By the way, yours truly got to uh, got to play a very critical role at Easter Vigil. I'm talking like I may be the altar server of the year now. It's, it's quite possible I could be getting the award because uh, yours truly and this very phone right here, held the light for father outdoors as he was beginning to, uh, you know, uh, begin the process of the, the, the lighting, the, the candle, the uh, Paschal candle. So I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not saying I was the greatest of all, but pretty close, pretty close. Michael Verlander is our guest. I'm teasing. Of course, Michael Verlander is our guest. FatimaFarm.com is the website. FatimaFarm.com. I encourage you to check it out. We're going to put a link to it. Michael, welcome back to the show. And can I just say, I thank you so much. You hosted us. You hosted us uh, a couple of weeks back when we were passing through. It was such a treat to be able to see Fatima Farm in person, hang out with your wonderful family, and even uh, even uh, be a part of a little a little session there, a little folk uh, music session. That was just a real treat for me and for my family. So, Michael, thank you for that. We we do appreciate that. I want to talk about. Yeah, you're welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, you're I, welcome, I, Joe. It was a it was a treat for sure. It's a uh, it's a little taste of heaven for us faithful to come together and play music and rejoice together. And I think that ties right into what we're talking about today about traditions, especially Easter traditions. How do we make the next fifty days like the best ever? How do we truly celebrate and keep keep the feast, as Saint Paul would say? How do we keep the feast of Easter um, over the next fifty days? What, what what will you be doing? Well, the the liturgical calendar lays out a lot of opportunities for us throughout these 50 days. So at Fatima Farm, we've got uh, a first Sunday coming up, which is which is next Sunday. Liturgically, that is that is low Sunday. Uh, it's, I think, low Sunday because it is a celebration of Easter. It's a celebration of the resurrection, not as high as Easter Day itself, but it is the close of the octave of Easter. Uh, it also goes by the name Quasimodo Sunday uh, because of the, the opening words of the introit or the, the first words of the, of the mass. Uh, and then it's also called Dominica in Albis, which means a, a Sunday in white. And I, I've heard a couple of different explanations for, for the, the white nature of that Sunday. Uh, one, I think my missile says that the neophytes, the, the newly baptized, it is on this Sunday that they can remove their white garment. Um, wow. but, uh, Maria Von Trapp, she remembers that on White Sunday, the first communicants uh, would wear white uh, to, to receive our, our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. 
Uh, so on this particular Sunday, we are, we're ready for a carnival. We're going to have some, some carnival games set up, just some real simple things like uh, throwing ping pong balls into cups and, and <laughs> throwing bean bags at cans and throwing rings around, um, around um, spikes coming out of the ground. And then you can get tickets and turn those tickets in for, uh, for treats. Um, so the kids have a good time doing that. It's mostly the teenagers who are running the games. They do a mm -hmm. great job. And then we transition from those games and we head to the gazebo and we do folk dances to live music. So I do, I, I'm mostly a part of the band uh, and, and a, a few, a few of us play, play some good folk music, some jigs and reels and some polkas. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll teach, we'll, we'll teach uh, some, some families how to do these old dances. And, and some of it is, uh, well, I'm, I'm all of it for us. It's not something that we, we grew up with and we've just kind of learned as we've gotten older because we thought it's uh, not only good for us, but it's the best way to raise our family. Um, not just to hold on to old lifestyles of the past, but it is uh, it, it also contributes to them holding on to the Catholic faith. So that's our first Sunday coming up. Yeah. You know, in the last segment, I talked about uh, Catholic Joe Biden and his trans proclamation day that was uh, for Easter Sunday, which is absolutely appalling in so many ways. And then I read St. Augustine's homily, short little homily from 1600 years ago on the same day. And St. Augustine warns us to be careful about our, free, our friends, especially those Catholics that could cause us the most uh, damage. St. Augustine says, it's not the pagans that I'm worried about. It's not the heretics. It's not the, the Jews. It's the Catholics. It's the Catholics, bad Catholics who could corrupt you. So being careful about our friends is, is very important to us. And I think something you just said kind of made me think about that is that the opposite could also be true. Great Catholics could be great for us. If bad Catholics are really bad, then great Catholics are really good. How important is it to for surround ourselves with a fantastic Catholic community? Uh, I, I think it's very important uh, because uh, that's where we receive the, the support that we need of other like-minded families and, and parents who, uh, who, who can help one another, learn from one another uh, to, to, to raise our children the way we, we, we hope to. Um, I don't know everything. Um, there's... Uh, there's there's other dads who 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 can help me and and doing a lot of things around the farm uh, and um, also not just physical jobs to be done around here uh, but also spiritual things as well advice that we can give one another how have you dealt with your your children through through this particular period um, what about going off to college um, questions like that um, friends are are a tremendous um, resource to help us do it in a godly way, uh, especially good friends. And, and dads have to be kind of guardians of not just the friends that we have for ourselves, but also the friends that we have for our, for our children. So, you know, when, when I send out invitations for our gatherings, there's, there's some language in my invitations that kind of self-select the families that are going to come. I, I tell everybody, um, dress modestly, leave the electronics at home, um, and, and these are the things that we're going to be doing, folk dancing. Well, right there, there's a lot of families that are going to decide that's not really our thing. That's, that, I'm not sure about that. So they, they stay home. But, but there are times where families come and, and uh, they, they, they clearly are not <clears throat> aligned with the values that we have. And it, it's my responsibility to talk to, the, talk to the other dad or talk to the mom and 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 put up a, a a boundary and say this is the expectations of Fatima Farm. This is why we're doing it, and this is what we expect of you. If you're going to come here, and the way the way you dress or the way you act, and and that 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 means that I'm not always nice. You know, I'm going to be charitable. I'm going to speak the truth, but but not always nice. And, mm -hmm. and dads need to be willing um, to not be nice sometimes. And if you're my age, that can be hard to do because growing up in the '80s. Uh, we were we were certainly taught to be very 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 nice and uh, very sentimental. Yeah, it's true. So, how do you help your kids? I mean, um, 
do you how do you spot bad apples in your especially in your kids' life, especially at the at the parish? How do you spot the bad apple and how do you how do you help them steer clear from bad friendships? Yeah, well, it it's, it starts very early. It starts early. Uh, so teaching teaching your children lessons about modesty and and good music and good taste. And as they grow up into their their teenage years, um, they they spot the bad apples themselves. Mm. Um, and 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 I I think if you if you implement those those standards very early, uh, they come to understand it and they they can they can see it themselves uh so that's where it begins but then but then one, once it starts happening you just you ask questions you know tell me about this friend what do you think about that why do you think he acts this way why do you think he listens to that kind of music what do you think about it and then just talk ask questions and talk through that conversation so you can get them off to the right path which is straight and narrow um it's not broad um, what's broad and wide leads to the wrong destination yeah, St. Augustine talks about that in his homily. Be careful who your friends are, because they could lead you to hell. And that's sort of like forever. You don't want that. That'd be bad. We'll put a link to FatimaFarm.com in the show notes, along with the homily from St. Augustine and everything else we talked about over at the at uh, the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Michael Verlander. You can hang out with us hopefully in the after show, but otherwise, thanks for being on with us today. God love you. God bless you. We'll see you guys right back here tomorrow. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone, and happy Easter. Uh, happy Easter, Trad Jack Burton. Um, praise be to God. How was your Easter, Jake? We had some really uh, wonderful liturgies. We didn't do the fully, so do you, do you want me to get into it? We didn't do the fully traditional uh, uh, Holy Week. We did the no? uh, We did the 1962 Holy Week. Which oh, is okay. not the traditional well, Holy Week. I, do, you, oh, do you want me to get into why oh, these, Joe? How oh many? My, how many? How many? I'm gonna weep a tear Joe, for you, Jake. Joe, really how many? Am. How many readings were at your were at your Easter vigil? Well, we also didn't do the pre. Were there, were there four? Yeah, exactly. We, we, we also did, did the six. Did you know that the Novus Ordo vigil actually has optionally more readings than the than the <laughs> Easter vigil? Just saying. But ouch. Um, but uh, ouch. anyway, so I have uh, in in years past, I have assisted with uh, with a pre fifty five uh, triduum, and that was quite amazing. But also, uh, traditionally, the Easter vigil wouldn't wouldn't count for your Easter Sunday obligation. So, but now that with with the current code and the fact that it happens after, you know, whatever time of day and everything, yeah. uh, obviously it does count. So, um, but anyway, well, it was still, it was still lovely. we you know, everything went off pretty, pretty much without a hitch, uh, except for, <laughs> I'll, I'll embarrass our, our MC. Uh, but they almost forgot to, ouch. to do the, uh, the renewal of, uh, baptismal promises after the blessing of the font. They, they went, they went back to start to get ready for mass and then someone was like oh wait we forgot to do that so like they came back out father came back out and was like oh we have to do the uh oh the that's fun promises yes yeah, so hey um, jen it was, but it was beautiful jen good morning to you thanks for hanging out with us today mimi and janice and yvonne and laura and sharon mike k eileen good morning to you damon troy lockett good morning to you james 16897 praise be to god good morning to everybody over on our telegram group uh, I love seeing it grow, by the way. The only way to get into the Telegram group is be on the email list. If you join the insider email list on the website, then you get immediate access to the Telegram group. We'd love to have you hanging out. So make sure to be on the email list. Just go to the station the cross.com forward slash ACT. Diane Stroud, good morning to you. Laura, good morning to you. Laura says, sometimes my Catholic friends are causing me issues these days. Gossip. And I try to stop it by uh, changing the subject or saying something more about people talking, uh, something nice about what people are, or it's about the people you're talking about, I guess, saying something nice about those people. We are a work in progress. Yeah, I think that's true for all of us, Laura. I think that's fair and true for all of us. And I definitely think that's very common. You know, we can, especially uh, among my trad friends, we can definitely sit and just go on and on and on about all the troubles in the church. And that has its place, but it also has its limits too, right? Becky, good morning to you. Grew up Catholic, never knew of TLM. Family was the, the family was the, was the lack 
lackadaisical Catholics, I'm guessing, and I'm uh, relearning my faith. The lo- the lone boat in the sea of my family. I can relate to that. I also am the lone boat on a on a uh, lonely sea, so so to speak. Sharon, good morning to you. Color pencils one hundred and one. Good morning to you, Edwin. Lights ten. Uh, Robert, good morning to you. Bruce, welcome to the team. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Evelyn, good morning to you. Brandon Joseph, Miroslav, hopefully I said that correctly. Pretty much got that wrong, I'm sure. Uh, Mea culpa. Which, oh, which is another cool tradition. Is we always get a seminarian for for uh, Holy Week and uh, Easter and the Triduum. Mm-hmm. And they always send us a, a seminarian who can chant. And boy, can they ever, they're, they're good at it. And this year we got a deacon, a, 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 like a, a transitional deacon. He'll be ordained if it be God's will um, pretty soon. So pray for him. But boy, the guy could chant. He could chant. It was so nice. Um, let's see here. Bruce, uh, Gregory, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Appreciate seeing you here. David L., good to see you on the team. Lots of conversation about some beautiful masses. I'm glad to hear that. Becky, good morning to you. Mm, Chesty Marine, Semper Fi, brother. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Let me know what's your some of your uh, surprise puppies is back. Welcome back to the team. Glad you're here. Troy Lockett, I see you over there as well. Hey, what are your some of your favorite traditions, especially around Easter? I, I want to know. Daniel Hyatt, good morning to you. Jane, good morning to you. Patty, Don Paddock, Junior Barra, Lori, good morning to you all. Thank you for hanging out with us today. Let me know what your favorite traditions are. Colored, uh, Edwin is responding to color. I pray St. Ambrose sends someone to my family to uh, to reach them. You know what I do? One of my, KSW, good morning to you. One of my traditions, and I do it every Sunday, actually. Polo Chicho, my friend. Um, you got your Paschal candle, huh? It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, get yourself a Paschal, an old Paschal candle, because it's blessed. It's got special blessings. It's it's pretty pretty amazing. If you can get one, get one. Get it. Uh, to, I can't tell you how I got mine. Not allowed. But nonetheless, what I do every Sunday, one of my traditions as a dad is I go up after Mass and I offer Thanksgiving to first of all Saint Joseph, my patron, and then to Our Lady, uh, and I consecrate my wife and my kids to my to Our Lady. But when it comes to my family. I uh, my uh, my uh, blood relatives that are away from the church, the sacrament of salvation. I recommend them to Our Lady. I go to the mother and uh, as the queen mother, as the Gibira, as her job is to be intercessor. And so I ask, I recommend my my uh, my family to her and ask her to intercede on their behalf to save their souls. So um, you can't, you don't have authority over your mom and your dad or your your cousins or your siblings. You don't have authority over those people as an adult, but you can recommend them. And that's kind of what I do. I do that every single Sunday, but I also reconsecrate my family every Sunday as well. Uh, Michael is still on the team with us today. Michael from FatimaFarm.com. Praise be to God. So uh, what, what, which ma- which Sunday mass was that? Do, do you guys like early as possible in the day or like, are you, uh, are you high mass family? Which mass do you go to? Uh, we're a high mass family. And for Easter Sunday, it was high mass as well. Our, uh, our Easter vigil was before midnight. And our priest made that clear that uh, if we were going to meet the Sunday obligation, we needed to come back. So the, the 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 Easter Sunday mass was packed, uh, but I heard from those who went to the Easter vigil that it was not packed, <laughs> and I, I and bet. I think that yeah. really tells you that 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 tells you that the message of uh, of meeting the obligation got out. Um, so so uh, we always go to the high mass. It, it's long, but it's it's beautiful, and uh, it, I think that's. The, even my youngest children, my, my, my six-year-old, I think from that high mass, he understands uh, what's going on in the mass uh, much, much better because of, of all the ceremony that takes place. And while he doesn't understand the language, he understands uh, that what we're doing is very important and that he, he needs to be on his best behavior. And 
he needs to give nothing but um, respect and reverence to what's going on because it's it's obviously so important. Uh, and right now he's learning the words. He's learned uh, as he's preparing for first communion. He is he is memorizing um, things like holy days of obligation and uh, an act of contrition. And some of these words he can barely pronounce. Uh, that's okay. Um, he is learning it uh, by heart, and knowledge and understanding uh, will come later, and and that's fine. I think one of the reasons why things have changed so much is that we've put such an emphasis on understanding that we don't have children memorize anything anymore because we don't think that they'll understand. Uh, and even though they memorize the words early on, uh, they can come to understand it later. I mean, I I I, I didn't know what the word bounty meant when I learned the. Uh, you know, bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts, which are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. I mean, I, I had no idea what bounty meant until I was probably 30, 35 years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but we learn those prayers as, as children, uh, and they they uh, they find a, a deep place, um, not just in our memory, but in our heart as well. Amen. Well said. Well said. Uh, Evelyn says, it takes time to learn. I'm still at it. Lifelong Catholic, but will die a TLM. Will die, will die a TLM. It's, part of it's covered, so I, I can't read it all. The pastor is tireless devotions, rosaries, masses, etc. Yay and amen. It does take time to learn. The, you have to let it grow in you. You know, I've shared this before, but when I first uh, started going to a mass that was in Latin, was not the TLM. It was a Novus Ordo ad Orientum, but everything was in Latin and Gregorian chant. So. You know, you could easily mistake it, mistook it for a, like a, a 62 TLM or, or older. But um, it was off-putting. Like I didn't understand anything and it felt strange and awkward or whatever. You know, oh, uh, two things happened. One, I realized because I had been to Mass in Italian. I'd been to Mass in Spanish. I'd been to Mass in Portuguese. I want to say I might have been to Mass in in Vietnamese once as well. I forget, there might have been one or two others, but nonetheless, as you begin to realize, like, okay, for starters, I, I got I, I pretty much know where I'm at. Like, a, you don't have to be a, a liturgist, like a trained liturgist, like a lot of these par- parishes have these days, trying <laughs> lay liturgists. Anyway, it's another rant for another day. Um, to figure out where you're at. Okay, well, number one. Number two, it began to grow on me. It was like a little seeds that get planted and they begin to germinate and they begin to come to a sort of a, a, a harvest and you get drawn into it a little bit more and more as you go and you start to realize that the intentionality here there's intentionality that you don't see elsewhere there's an intention that then intention to the point of being of exaggerating a syllable in the gregorian chant for instance which i never could have understood before that it's like why do we do this why do we why don't we just sing normal? Like, can't we just sing? I will raise you up for crying out loud on Eagle's wings. <laughs> like, no, we can't do that. Why not? Uh, well, there's lots of reasons, but nonetheless, um, the intentionality of everyone involved to, to give it your absolute best. In other words, you can't, you, you can give God nothing. He doesn't need anything from us. Nothing will truly satiate God, but you can give him your heart's desire, your full intent, your absolute best effort. As is just like a child, uh, I, when my little my little ch- children, when they would demonstrate their love for uh, for for mom and dad, you know, trying to make us happy, we we recognize that in them, even if they didn't do it perfectly, we still would recognize it. We still make our heart uh, full of joy. Similarly, God sees that. But how many don't put their best effort? How many don't give their full intent, their full effort behind the the divine liturgy? You know, and I, one of my, as I was saying uh, on Holy Thursday, Holy Saturday, rather, my brain is still half asleep. Holy Saturday, I read through the letter to the Hebrews from St. Paul. And he makes this point, too, about this intentionality. He also makes distinctions between the tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem, which were shadows of the realities that are in heaven. And if the high priest who offers a bull <clears throat> for his own sins and a goat for the sins of all the people, notice the contrast, and blood must be shed to redeem sins. How much more the the the, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Savior Jesus Christ, who enters the actual temple, not the pretend one on earth, 
but the actual one. And he points out the intentionality. Intentionality matters. And I think that's part of that journey of all of us as we move from ourselves towards the divine. And as we get closer to the divine, we get more, we, we appreciate more the smells and bells, the intentionality of traditions handed on from one generation to the next down through the, the, the millennia. And keeping the feast, as St. Paul would say. By the way, Sci-Fi Mike, welcome to the team. Mike Peaches, good morning to you. Eastern Rites also dipped the Paschal candle. I did not know that. I'd never even seen that done before. It was my, my mind was utterly blown. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. James 16897, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out. Deborah, Deborah Saints, good morning to you. I'm glad you appreciated that. I did. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for saying so. KSW and K, KSB. Any relation between the two of you? I'm just curious. Um, KSW says, speaking of Jewish temple, you all hear about the red heifer? Yes, we, um, we've covered the red heifer story here a couple of months ago, Jake, was it? I yeah, think I, I brought think, up I think a few months ago, something like that. Yeah. About the, uh, the heifers from Texas that got shipped to, to Israel. I think I talked about it one in the back, actually at the end of the last year, because I was in the midst of producing my documentary film on the end times. And we talked about the evangelical cause for, for uh, helping to support the building of the third temple, which would be the temple of the antichrist. And you don't want to be on the, uh, the building committee that helps to bring about the antichrist agenda. You don't want to be on that. But yes, I have seen that story. And they've gone to the point, there's an entire institution, Joshua Charles and I talked about it actually, and he pointed this out as a part of the documentary film. Um, They have an entire institution that's not that far away from the Temple Mount. And they have a fake ramp and a fake altar where they're practicing. They're doing the smells and bells uh, to prepare for building that third temple and they had the red heifers, which by the way, the red heifers some say are what triggered the al flood and the massacre on October the 7th. Cause the Muslims see that and they go, Oh, you think you're going to build a temple? Well, watch this. And then the, that's when things kicked off. So it's definitely all very related, but it kind of reminds me, I want to get Michael's take on this. Um, October the 8th, one week from today, Total eclipse. Job and seven cities called Nineveh are going to be on the path, the direct line, the, the the pinnacle path of this. Do we read too much into that? How do you see it? Uh, when I hear such details, Joe, uh, my my instinct is is just really. I mean, are you, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, there, there's right. there's how many cities called Nineveh? And, seven, and and there's seven and. The, all, All of them, are, on them the line. are in the path. Yeah. That's incredible. And in the city of Jonah, and I think there's a city in Canada that's that's called Nineveh, the one there. Yeah. That's part of the, the path as well. What do you think could be uh, the it, message in all that? It, 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 it's, it's, well, the, I think it's the same message that was given to Nineveh. Repent. Repent. Yeah. And, and, we, and we've got, <clears throat> as a people... Uh, we we can we can pray that our leaders will be like the the leader in Nineveh who took up sackcloth and ashes and re- and repented and, and got his people to do so as well. It 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 clearly seems to be a, a warning uh, along with the message of repent. Uh, and and <clears throat> I was I had planned on traveling to see the the total eclipse for uh, for years, literally years. I I told my my uh, one of my best buddies in Ohio, I said, uh, save a place for us in the driveway because um, <sighs> on April 8th, 2024, we're coming. And that was in 2017 after we experienced that a, the, a full eclipse here in Georgia. It was one of the most it, it was the most impressive thing, natural phenomenon that I had ever experienced. And I and I, and I said, where when is this going to happen again? Uh, so I planned that trip, counted down the days, uh, but my my children's confirmation date came up on the same day. Um, mm. So we're going to have to stay home, uh, and that may be a good thing. Who who knows what's going to happen that day? But I'm 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 certainly happy that all my children are going to be home from school, and it's a first Saturday. Well, it's close to a first Saturday, so uh, we will 
have uh, gone to confession recently, and we're going to be prepared for for Monday for the sacrament and also for the for the eclipse as well. Wow. You know, you just reminded me, 2017, the total eclipse, I was at the University of St. Thomas. It's the Catholic University here in Houston, Catholic University here in Houston. And um, there's some great faculty there. Nonetheless, I remember, you know, I was broadcasting live as a radio guy, as a professional Catholic radio guy, I was broadcasting live from this event that they were hosting and looking up the very next day, um, Hurricane Harvey hit. And um, almost the entire city was impacted by this incredible event. I can't tell you how many neighborhoods after neighborhoods after thousands, hundreds of thousands of residents were displaced through flooding. Um, homes utterly destroyed. And I, um, I got caught in the middle of all of that. My own family was rescued by a boat in our front yard, you know, taken out of our neighborhood by a boat from Tennessee. It was just... It was otherworldly. We had on the Sunday, we had 70 plus tornado warnings within the span of a couple of hours. A tr- no, I think it was like nine trillion. Ga- I can't remember how many trillions of gallons. The, the, the lot of water fell from the sky on Sunday alone. Our neighborhood flooded the next day. It was blue skies. And our neighborhood filled up like a bathtub because <laughs> the water was coming down the river and uh, and flooding our neighborhood. It was just otherworldly, and it happened right with that, right with that total eclipse. Was it a sign? I don't know, but we'll say this: we're going to cover the eclipse later this week with a guest who's been doing a lot of uh, a lot of commentary and putting uh, some of the puzzle pieces together on the eclipse. That's coming up on Wednesday, I believe. So stick around for that. But nonetheless, I don't think you have to be a conspiratorialist. I don't think you have to be afraid of the shadows. I just think you have to be prudent. I think you just demonstrated that, Michael. Just be prudent, right? Go to confession, live in a state of grace, and trust in God. And then what else do we have to worry about? Literally nothing, right? I mean, isn't that the beauty of it? No, that's right, Um, Joe. I I think it is... um... It's a, a, a very extraordinary uh, event that is giving us the same message that we ought to uh, be reminded of every day. And that is a, a message of, of turning away from sin and to God. Uh, and we ought to make that, that act of contrition at the end of every, at the end of every day. We uh, examine our consciences and we make that act of contrition. Uh, and I, I think a total eclipse like this, passing over cities like Nineveh and Jonah, uh, it's 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 uh, it's God taking a megaphone and and giving us the same message of of metanoia, of turning away from God, of, of turning away from sin to God. Mm. Hey, Rachel Jordan, welcome to the team and good morning to you. It says also the relic of St. Jude's arm is going to be in Tyler, Texas during the time of the eclipse. Oh, that's super cool. St. Jude. There is a great, great video by Father Carlos Martins on the Gabby After Hours YouTube channel that descri- that explains how we have the arm of St. Jude. It's very, very good. St. Saint, uh, Saint Jude, pray for us, especially in these dark, difficult days. You know, I also want to talk about um, just marriage in general. It's so obvious that the final confrontation is over the family. I mean, something I am I'm constantly harping on is sacramental marriage between a man and a woman and how it must be defended in, in public uh, square and how so many so-called conservatives aren't actually defending marriage. A lot of the conservatives that we have in office today are the ones that are expecting our votes in the next election do not defend marriage between a man and a woman. And as Catholics, we kind of get we get funneled into one of two camps. It's all only this camp or only that camp. And I keep pointing out that we should reject both of these options and just be Catholic. Let the chips fall where they may. And so many Catholics are so willing to to sell this one thing down the river, marriage, um, and not defend it. St. Augustine reminded us in his homily that, that it must be we must stand on the firm foundation of, of sacramental marriage between a man and a woman. How important really is that? And I think that's a big part of what I see in Fatima Farm is just uh, making families great again. What would you say to that, Michael Verlander? It's, 
uh, strong families are the building block of a healthy society. Uh, so human positive law ought to be based on the natural law, and the natural law uh, ought to be a, a participation in the divine law. Uh, so it, it's not something that we can just overlook and not participate in, uh, but it is something that we lay people especially ought to, ought to participate in and influence how we can uh, so that the, the human positive law reflects the natural law, which reflects the divine law. Uh, we can't embrace a separation of, of, of God and human law. Uh, there, it ought to be integrated, and uh, we ought to be the ones who are, are trying to make that happen. Yeah, totally. Hey, Trad Herb Brooks is on the team today. Uh, Trad Herb Brooks, do you wear plaid for, for Easter Sunday? I'm just, just asking for a friend. <laughs> did, you wear, did you wear your plaid? Um, Chesty Marine, MFGA, make families great again. That's right. Ah, uh, golly gee whiz. Miriam, welcome to the team. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Good, good to see you here. Praise be to God. Laura says, it's over fa- It's over family, abortion, birth control, gay marriage, divorce, list goes on and on and on. Yeah, exactly. You know, I don't know about you, Michael, but I, uh, my wife and I both grew up in broken homes. So something I like to mention often is we both feel like we are faking it until, you know, right now because... N- Marriage was never demonstrated to us as as uh, as young people, so we we're having to learn the hard way. And then, obviously, our demonstration to our kids is super important. And it's also not not all that smooth all the time. Difficult marriage, based on a difficult past, trying to do something different and special can be can feel kind of rocky. But at the same time, I can say this: that my wife and I have committed ourselves to trying to give our kids some experience, at least something that is uniquely different than what we experienced. And how important is that, that uh, husbands and wives are committed and on the same page to when it comes to raising the family? Has that always been the case for uh, Have you and your wife had a very solid marriage? And I mean, you can share what you you don't, don't share what you don't want to feel comfortable sharing, but I'm just curious, like, what, what was that, what was this, what has it been like in your marriage? Well, thanks be to God, uh, my wife and I, Linda, we, we have had the example of our parents, uh, which both of them were married uh, for 60 plus years, Deo um, committed to one another. Um, my parents had eight children, uh, Linda's, Linda's parents had nine children, uh, and so we, we, we've had that, that example of, of, of lasting marriage and, um, and, and a fruitful marriage. Um, but what, what we're observing is the grandchildren are, are the ones especially that are, are falling away from the faith. They're the ones who are, are uh, not being married in the church. Uh, and so the, the, the apostasy especially is happening in that, that next generation. Um, now, for my wife and I, uh, we certainly have worked through times that for most marriages would have ended in divorce. I mean, I, I know that for a fact as we went through um, troubled periods, um, people looked at me and were surprised that I was still participating in my marriage uh, because they said, most people in your situation are gone and it's mm. a divorce. And, and I, and what I hold on to is I made a promise at marriage through good times and bad and sickness and health, uh, that I'm committed to this until death do we part. Uh, and so mar- mar- uh, divorce is just not, not an option, um, that I would consider. Um, now I understand in extreme situations under the, for the, for the safety of, of your children or yourself, um, that it would be prudent to pursue something like a separation. Uh, but in my situation, most people would have, would have been divorced just out of convenience uh, because the hardship was too much. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I said, no, this is why I'm married. Uh, my salvation is, is through this marriage with my wife, and my wife's salvation is through her marriage to me. This is how we grow in holiness. And it's through working 
through this that we can hope for eternal life. Um, so that's the way I, I've seen it. And, and right now it feels like we are, are coasting on, on some beautiful um, consolations. And uh, praise be to God. Amen. Yeah, Deo gracias. Yeah. Um, Don asks, who officially lights the Paschal candle at the Easter vigil? That's going to be the priest. It's going to be the presider, the celebrant. No, it's, some, uh, it's the deacon traditionally. Uh, is it? Yeah, traditionally the deacon sings the exultate and lights the. Uh, the I'm trying to I'm trying to remember Paschal from candle. Saturday. I'm squinching because I'm trying to remember. Well, did you have a, Did you have an official deacon? There? I was yes. holding the light. So, I was holding the light. I think and I, was I think really I think focused in the, on doing my job correctly. I think in the sixty-two, it's the priest. Uh, the deacon it, might help it? him, but the priest does it at the sixty-two. In the in the traditional yeah. one, the deacon sings the exalta and lights the, yeah, but, the candle. Yeah, okay. The he's you're talking about angels I, in the head I, of a I, pen. I, no, Don I'm. Oh no, it's very serious. But anyway, I already wrote it Don out. Don did not ask what was the traditional. He said, "Who officially lights the Paschal candle at, at the evening, evening e- Easter vigil?" And, and it might be different. It might be, you're going to say it's the deacon? Yes, correct. But it's probably the priest yes. in most cases. Exactly, because oftentimes you don't have a deacon available. So yeah, well, we uh, had we had ahead. a uh, we had a deacon and a subdeacon. There you go. Woohoo! Yes. And uh, oh, that's so you, another wait, thing. So you you was it, was it a solemn? So it was a solemn mass. Yeah, it was wonderful. Oh, wonderful! It was great. Uh, it was such a beautiful. It started at 10 p.m. Ended at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, that was longer than ours. Ours was under three hours. That was under three hours. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, buddy. I saved the seats 12 hours before, just to be sure, because <laughs> it was <laughs> packed. And then, uh, you know, well, my sons were at altar server training. So, you know, I figured pff, right there, we're going to be there a couple of times that day. Might as well go ahead and reserve the territory. So that's what we did. I'm sure that was unfair to some folk. But And, uh, and Chris, Christine yeah, is chiming in that, yes, it is the deacon. I'm assuming that's at the Nova Sordo Easter Vigil, Christine. Um, but he said, due to his lack of singing abilities, we have the cantor for the exalted. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. That's yeah. so I, I, I could never chant or anything like that in front of people. Good grief. That would be so embarrassing. It's pretty I don't, stressful. I don't That's why I like hiding in the choir loft to do it. Is it, can you, can you learn to do that? I mean, is it like a, a discernible trainable skill or do you have to be born with certain skill to, to really be good at it? There, there the are question. people who are just in, incapable of ever matching pitch, but if you can match pitch, you can learn to chant. At least, you know, um, you know, at a what if you're level, what if you're like in tone deaf? I mean, that's it. Yeah. Some people are just tone deaf and they can't match pitch. But if you can, then you can learn to chant. Yeah. It's actually nice. I think it's I think it's way easier to end up uh, learning them. Once, once you get over that little that little hump of learning chant notation, it's actually mm-hmm. really easy. It's way better than modern music notation. I've been singing for years and years and years, and I still can barely read modern music. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing I'm pitching is a tent, says Brandon Joseph <laughs> Hebert. <laughs> yeah, my kids have talent. I, however, do not. So we're just, I'll enjoy theirs, and that'll be about that. Laura says, tone deaf, always sit beside me at mass. That's, that's are your, you pointing that's your me out, to Laura? That's, that's, that's bear, right, Laura. That's right. I try not to sing too loudly when I'm at mass, just out of charity for my neighbor. <laughs> but, but nonetheless... Uh, we're out of time. Michael Verlander, God love you. I always love having the having you on the team and conversating about tradition and family and everything else. It's uh, really, really appreciated here. So thank you for that. God bless you and God love you, Michael. Thank you, Joe. Uh, happy Easter to you and God bless. Happy Easter to you as well, too, and your family. Enjoy your time. I wish we could have been there with the whole crew, especially on a, on a first Sunday. That would have been amazing, but maybe another time. Hey, guys, tomorrow on the team, Theone Bell, a tan author, is going to be on the team. She's got a new book out. We're going to talk about her new book. Plus, so much more is coming this week. Do share us with a friend. God love you all. 